Hi, my name is Will, and today I want to talk a little bit more about a follow-up to a video I did a couple of weeks ago on when will the tech jobs come back. I also did another video about pivoting to robotics. Between those two videos, I've gotten over 100,000 views in just a couple of weeks and over 800 comments, which is pretty wild for a channel that had a couple hundred subscribers on it. One of the things that's really cool about all the comments is that I'm getting a chance to talk to folks who are being affected by things like AI and the economy. And it gives me a chance to also hear from some folks who are in the field. For example, people who work in the robotics field are responding and adding extra details, which is really cool. I would highly recommend taking a few minutes to go check it out because there's just a lot of detail, especially some of the technical stuff, things like good links and stuff like that from the comments. I have a bunch of different topics to cover. I'm going to go ahead and include timestamps in the video. So if there's a particular question that you're really interested, you can just jump straight to that one. Let's just go ahead and get started with the first one, which is really more of a sense of the mood. I would say about 80% of the comments were basically to the effect of the jobs are never coming back. And that's kind of that. That was a lot of comments would so just be like one line, the jobs are never coming back. So it's about 80% there and about 20% were articulating things more like you just need to adapt, you need to learn new tech stacks. So it's kind of a sense of where the mood is at. One of the things that I think that's affecting the mood is a little bit of a dislocation in time. And what I mean by that is it's very easy to fall into the trap of thinking about something that you think will happen later as being a reality right now. A lot of the tech companies really do play on this, which is they'll show a tech demo for something and you get the sense that this is something that's going to ship like next week. But in a lot of cases, it turns out that's something that may not come for a while. That becomes this kind of tricky thing of managing through simultaneously, both thinking about what things look like today and where they might go into the future. And I'll talk more about the timeline stuff in a bit. But the first thing I wanted to talk to was a way to kind of temper expectations and kind of de-hype the experience a little bit. I would strongly recommend downloading and playing with one of the packages that lets you install and run LLMs and AI chatbots on your local dev machine. That way you can get a chance to really see more details about how these systems work, what their limitations are, instead of it just being a chatbot that you interact with through a browser that's run by a big company, instead you get a chance to just play with it yourself. The package that I'm using is one called LM Studio. It's just a regular desktop app. You can download it and then you can download other LMs and run a whole bunch of different ones. You can get ones that are specialty ones for coding or for general chat or whatever it is that you want to do. If you want to get started on AI and LLM technology and you don't have a background in that, but you are more thinking of as something that maybe you might want to integrate with a piece of software that you're writing, go pull it down, download it, and start playing with all the different VMs. It's also nice if you want to take a chatbot with you on the laptop and have access to it for offline use. It's also interesting if you want to see what an open source AI is capable of. They're very, very good, and a lot of them are very close to what you can get out of something like ChatGPT. That may be interesting for you, especially because you can download the open source ones and then use those to build that crazy AI startup idea that you have or whatever as a way to get started. If you want to switch to a CLI version later or something like that, that's fine. But it's just a really nice thing. And in LM Studio, they include links for documentation to explain all the terminology. So if you're not sure what quantization is or how that affects models, you can read up on all that stuff. It's free download. Check it out. No reason not to. If you're on a PC, then your graphics card is going to probably be your biggest limiter on the size of the models. The biggest constraint that you'll have is the video card. If you've got a good gaming rig, then you probably can download like a 10 gig file or an 8 gig LLM and run it locally. If you're on a Mac, I have a Mac Studio with 32 gig of RAM and I can load a 20 gig LLM, no problem. It's highly worth downloading it, playing with it. it. doesn't cost you anything. Like I said, just go for it. And that'll help maybe kind of reconcile these timelines for you a little bit to make you be more realistic about what timelines things may actually come down. The next one was a very common one, honestly, and it was a lot of people posting that they're in trouble. They've been laid off, and in some cases, it's been months or a year that they haven't found work yet. And so obviously, they're very concerned about that. And I think that that's where you have to be a little realistic about the situation. You might need to pivot to something, maybe another field. The number one advice for somebody, of course, who's looking for a job now is network, network, network. You can't rely on online posting. We'll talk about that more in a minute. The other one is, of course, make sure you use your unemployment benefits. You did pay for them. So if you haven't filed for it, you absolutely should do it immediately. The 
pivoting part of it is that you might want to think about other roles. For example, maybe you've been a software developer, but you were doing it for retail. That means you might want to switch to management or maybe a sales role, like a sales engineering kind of role or an analyst or a project manager. Just think about some of these options. I will caution folks that are thinking about something entrepreneurial, especially if it's like, I want to build an app or write a book or make a video game. Those spaces are all really, really full up right now. They're flooded. And so it's very difficult. Um, I actually got most of my success for being an entrepreneur through consulting and building out a consulting company. And so I might suggest that someone might think about a service business. If you want to start something that might be easier to get launched and get started. If entrepreneurial stuff is an interesting topic for folks, like what does it mean to start your own software development consulting company, let me know in the comments. And if there's enough interest, maybe that's something to do another video on. Regardless of whether or not you've already lost your job or you're worried about it, I would recommend that you should budget for a recession regardless of your outcome. Worst case, you've got a situation where you're saving for a retirement and worst case, you're going to need that money. Maybe you might need to move. Like you, maybe you get a job offer, but it's someplace else. That said, I just want to acknowledge that if you've lost your job and you're trying to find one, it is exhausting. It is frustrating. You have to both be able to keep your spirits up. So that way you're positive, especially if you actually go in for an interview. But you also have to acknowledge how frustrating and hard it can be. Coming up with strategies for managing through that, like, you know, Monday through Friday, maybe 10 to 2, that's your job, is finding your next job. And then give yourself the space to breathe. So still get up and get dressed and do all the things, but take the time. It's hard, and I would recommend being open with the frustrations with friends and family in a way that is still constructive. So do what you can. The next one is I had a lot of folks talking about recruiters and the experience of filing jobs and JDs and things right now. And a lot of people are posting, you know, talking about things like I've been firing off resumes. I don't hear anything back. What's weird about this is, is that I actually think recruiting is probably the front line for the AI wars right now. There are candidates who are using AI tools to do things like submit their resume to hundreds of positions in, in an hour. Um, there's actually startups that will offer to do that for you. We even see things like LinkedIn, it's easy apply button, which isn't really an AI, but that's how you get the hundreds or thousands of people applying to a job is if you just can click a button and apply. And the next thing you know, you're a recruiter drowning in candidates, which is the other side of it. The recruiting folks are now using applicant tracking systems or ATS systems that include AI technology embedded in them to do things like summarize the resumes and do evaluation scoring and stuff like that. So now you have this really weird situation where you've got candidates with AIs and the recruiters are using AIs and how, is any of this helping anybody? I, I don't think so. But what it does mean is, is that you just kind of have to assume that every position that you might think about applying to you just figure it's got at least 100, 300, 500 applicants. All you can do is just get kind of chill about it. Fire off the applications to the online ones if you need to, to maintain your unemployment benefits. But realistically, it's very unlikely that you're going to get a job just by posting something on a resume board. That's where I come back to. You got a network. The next one that came up a lot, and this is one that is kind of heartbreaking. And they'll post something like, I'm in school right now. I'm a junior for a CS degree. What do I do? Do I stick with it? Do I switch? Some of them, they're pretty stressed out about this stuff. But the first thing I would say is if you're okay with getting a kind of more normal or lower level salary, and especially if you like the CS work, then I would say right now, go ahead and stick with it. But if you're only doing it because you think you're going to make crazy good money and otherwise you're not very into CS, then I would definitely reconsider it. By way of example, you know, we might go from like I'm in the Seattle area. And so, you know, a six figure income and maybe a signing bonus to join a FANG company or Microsoft or something like that might have been something that would be more plausible. But right now, if you're a CS student coming out, you might say, OK, well, I'm going to make significantly less than that. Maybe you don't get any equity stake because you take a job with a smaller company or something like that. If you still like CS and you want to keep doing it in that environment, then I think it's probably makes sense. The next one is make sure that you've added in a domain, not just your CS. And what I mean by that is like, are you marketing or do you know how to do agriculture or retail or something else that you can kind of hang your hat on that's not just basic CS stuff, because that's how recruiters typically will slot. They're going to look for, you know, I need a CS person who knows retail. 
The only exception to that is if you truly are into the next tier, which might be compilers or embedded systems or something else like that, you might be able to get some traction. But I'll note that a lot of the folks that are in, even in the robotic space are also reporting that they're not having that much better of a time finding jobs too. Another point on this about recruiting is if you're in a, you know, a junior in your CS program, still make friends with recruiters, offer to buy them coffee and get their feedback and talk to them. And that's doubly or triply true if your hope is to get a job locally somewhere. If you want to get a job that maybe near your hometown or the town that you're going to college in, then the networking with people in that space is going to be really important which is the other one around networking, which is if you're going to college and especially if you're paying, you know, big money to go to college, you need to be networking while you're in school. Let's say that you're in a CS program and there's, you know, 40 or 50 other kids in that program. Those kids may in turn wind up going to work in tech jobs and you want them to want to refer you in. You want to be, have those guys that you are in your program with refer you to the recruiters, right? Refer those to other hiring managers. If you're the sort of kid that just goes into school, takes your classes, goes home, but doesn't really talk to other kids, then you're not really getting your money's worth. And you're also going to be hurting yourself trying to get your, your job out of school. I know that for a lot of CS majors, being social and, and networking and things like that, maybe that doesn't come easily, but it's also just reflecting the situation that we're in. Another comment that I got was from some folks who were just like, I don't like tech. I want to switch to something else. Um, I think that's more common, especially when folks get a little bit further into their career. One of the things that I just, it sits in my brain is I see demographic data. So for example, here's this data JavaScript survey, and it shows average ages and some of the other demographics. And I'm not going to go too into the weeds on that other than to just say, look, you know, there is a drop off, especially related to age in tech, what and why and what's driving that that's a whole separate conversation, but it exists. And so how does that affect how you think about your career and your planning and what you want to do with yourself? I do think it's interesting and notable. I've absolutely know people who are in their sixties, who are still working in tech and they enjoy it, but doesn't mean that you can't, it just means thinking about it and being mindful about why people are or are not choosing to stay into tech. A couple of people asked if I'm an AI and all I can say is that is it's kind of a weird question. It doesn't look like anything to me. Next question. A lot of folks uh, are pointing out that the figure AI CEO apparently has gone on record saying that they want to shoot for a closer to 50 K price point. So in the video, I was talking about sort of an upper bound of 500 to a million. Part of the reason I was citing those larger figures is to try to establish when the technology could be economically viable. And basically part of the point was that if it's financed, then the price points for viability are actually a lot lower. I think that the robots might start out more expensive and then they get down to cheaper price points over time. And by way of analogy, almost every EV startup starts out with this high-end luxury model. And then over time, they try to expand it as they get production sorted out to do lower cost cars over time. That process can take you know, longer than people might expect, but that's kind of generally the, the, the model. The first few figure robots might be really expensive and then the price points get down over time, which all again comes back to timeline. And on the timeline, I did just see a report that Mercedes is apparently already trialing humanoid robots. So there you go. All right, the next one is unemployment rate and statistics. A couple of people are pointing out that unemployment rates don't necessarily reflect everybody who's in or out of the market. For example, if you've been looking for a job for too long, then they stop tracking that as part of the core unemployment rate. I just want to note that, that there is that sort of default core metric for unemployment, which is cited over and over, and that whether or not it does or doesn't shift or not, the metaphor I would make is to the S&P 500. The S&P 500, is not the whole economy, only large cap stocks in the US, but it's a common benchmark and people report on it, which is kind of weird because businesses rotate in and out of the S&P 500 over time. If this is something that bothers you, if you want to focus on a different kind of unemployment tracker, I would say go for it. You can go up to the FRED website just for starters and pick other unemployment trackers that do things like overall labor participation rates or include people who are looking past the windows that are typically there. And all I would say to that is if there's something about tracking a different data set that gives you something you can take action on, then I would say definitely focus on it. 
check it out. Look at these different things. Maybe you have a startup idea that somehow is tied to unemployment somehow, or maybe you're building an investment portfolio around it. Um, but point is, is go to the Fred site. You can check lots of different kind of data um, and just see what works works and what doesn't. The next point of feedback was essentially on long lines of the AI tech is going to go exponential, like as in it's we're going to be fine. And then all of a sudden there's going to be this crazy hockey stick up and things will change fast. And I just watched the NVIDIA video with these crazy new Blackwell chipsets where they're developing not just ways to stack the chips, but also to do backplanes that are high speed to basically hold down at data centers, feel like one giant system for being able to do things like training and inference and all that fun stuff. And it's impressive as, I mean, it's just crazy. What the conversation to me becomes how much of this is a question of the bits and how much of it is the atoms and the energy use and all those trade-offs. It's almost impossible to keep up on all the innovations that are happening in the space right now. Reconciling that with the reality that I have, which is every time I see one of these things, especially on the image generation space or the 3D modeler generator system where they were using AI to generate models and textures, I, and what's crazy was it just kind of didn't work very well. Like it said it was going to do all these models, but what it was producing wasn't very usable. The same thing with a lot of the images. Every time I've sat down and tried to actually use imagery for things with an image generator, I wind up falling back on stock photos instead because they're better image quality. It's just very strange. Like on the one hand, you've got NVIDIA and these crazy videos talking about all the stuff that's coming, the capabilities of what we have now, and the hype curve. But then when I actually use it, it, it's not there yet. So this is very strange. I think that's part of the point of like why this video or this channel or some of the stuff I'm talking about is kind of interesting right now, because it's this strange series of inflection points. And we're all, everybody, you know, you watching the video, me making it and talking to my friends and all this stuff, we're all trying to make sense of this stuff. And that's where I keep coming back to the economic data as being the, the core for what brings a sense of sanity to this stuff, because you know, simply put, if this tech keeps coming out and it keeps being interesting, but if we don't see it in the economic data, then is it just like a nice tool or a nice to have thing? But the more we see people getting their actual jobs replaced, then that's a bigger factor, which is kind of comes back to that timeline. Just in the last few years, we've had, you know, 3D printing was supposed to be every house was going to have a 3D printer in it and we wouldn't go to the store anymore. VR, just a few years ago, there was a lot of hype around the metaverse and that we were all going to put VR headsets on and live in them all day, like Ready Player One. I have a Quest 3, I like it, I use it for exercise, but I don't want to live in that thing or have it on all day long. Um, crypto is supposed to take over the world, right? And we can talk about why that does or doesn't work and what the point is, but it's certainly not replacing Visa anytime soon. Another one, of course, is self-driving cars. We've been talking about that for almost a decade now, and it's always like next year, two years, three years out, right? So what is that timeline? We don't know. And so it's sort of this exhausting situation where we're contending with the scenarios from whether or not you have a job now or not, whether or not your futures look like one thing or the other, and we don't really know, all the way up to a complete social singularity moment that breaks everything. So it's kind of exhausting and a lot. We just have to sort of plan for all of that. And it's that last scenario where things start to hockey stick in ways, where the jobs start to change. That is what segues to the conversation around UBI. And so a lot of people would just comment things like, you know, when will the tech jobs? And then they just respond, UBI. Right. As far as UBI goes, I've got next video on that, which is what is UBI. And, I, and in that video, I want to cover how much UBI will cost, how we could pay for it, and what we would likely have to see happen with some of the economic data before there would be popular support to actually implementing a UBI and what level. Of course, on all this Q&A about jobs and all that stuff, I hope you like this video. Feel free to you know like, subscribe, and all that fun stuff ring the bell. The other ones, of course, go ahead and chime in with the comments. Like I said, I am reading all the comments right now and super cool. So thank you so much for taking all the time to watch this video. Talk to you later.